I think Dr. Herman Gritter is the next to talk about very much the same topic. Just a little bit of background here quickly is that um, he is from, he's from SRK Consulting Canada in Vancouver, adjunct uh, professor with the uh, University of, of uh, Alberta. And um, it's today we, we carry, continue talking about the cumulative indicator mineral and micro diamond technologies in the pre-mining assessment of primary diamond de deposits. Over to you, Dr. Gritta. And, and importantly, just don't forget he grew up in Cape Town. <laughs> we won't yes. hold that against him. <laughs> and, and I studied at UCT under John Gurney. Yeah. Good morning, <laughs> Dr. Gritta. <laughs> good morning. So yes, I have good credentials. Should we just wait a couple of minutes for, um, for people who might want to join at exactly whatever the designated time is? Okay. Or should I just should I just start? No, well, if you got if you got some and some story about what's happening over your side, give us a little bit more background, then uh, we can we can wait for the clock. It's another two minutes to go. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. So just by way of introduction, um, this is the start of a set of lectures that I've been giving at um, at the University of Alberta now for about fifteen years. Uh, I normally go up there for two days and I interact with the academics there, in particular Tom Stachel, uh, Bob Luth and Graham Pearson. They're a formidable team up at, uh, at the University of Alberta. And so I have the privilege of sharing my, my view of, the, of this industry with, with the students. Um, and I have done so for 15 years. And so as a result of that experience, uh, John contacted me and he said, look, don't you want to share it with the students in Southern Africa? And I'm very happy to do so. Um, but just bear in mind that uh, these set of lectures were developed initially 15 years ago. Um, and for, for, this, uh, for this lecture series, I've comprehensively updated everything that I've, uh, that I've done. So I put a lot of work into, um, into these lectures that are now starting off. Um, and the reason I had to put a lot of work into it is because um, the format of our computer screens has changed. Uh, and we now have these landscape style presentations and it turns out you can put a lot more information on one slide and you will see that theme playing forward uh, as we go through these sets of lectures. So it's six o'clock uh, and my time in the morning um, and we'll start with Mantle Indicators 101. If there are some bits of a repeat in the front end of, of these lectures with what has uh, been said before, uh, I apologize. It was probably said at four o'clock in the morning my time when I was asleep. Um, so uh, yes, just a front, front image. Um, we will talk about both these two images that, that are on this uh, front page. The one on the um, top left is from Nick Sobolev. Uh, it was published in 1973. It's a chrome calcium plot for garnets where chrome is on the x-axis. Um, the one in the middle is a chrome calcium plot for garnets. It was published by Gurney in 1984. Um, and you will see chrome is on the y-axis. Um, and so that has caused some um, some, some interesting discussion in the industry around whether the Russian diagram on the left um, is definitive or whether the, the middle diagram over here is the definitive diagram to use in Southern Africa. We all use the chrome calcium plot as in the Gurney style, but when you go into the Russian literature, you will find uh, a calcium chrome plot uh, instead. I'm just going to stop my video here um, and give credit to Aneta Banas of the University of Alberta for some of the great pictures that I will be showing um, as we go through the talk. Here's a cross section um, through uh, what we consider as a, a craton that's floating in an asthenosphere. Um, it's an autistic rendition that was commissioned by De Beers um, quite a few years ago, but it's, incre it's incredibly um, intuitive and it turns out to be scientifically uh, quite correct. 
Um, the thing that you have to notice here is that we have a stable shield area in the middle. That's what we call the craton. Um, it's been stable roughly since the Archean. And then as you go towards the edges, we go through an area that's often referred to as the craton margin, and then off craton into what is often referred to as the mobile belt. And that change has been found to correspond with the distribution of diamonds um, in primary kimberlite sources, uh, sources as you go you know, through the section. In this case, the section has a subduction zone on the left-hand side and a mantle plume upwelling on the right-hand side. Um, and all of these things are impacting the base of the lithosphere where diamonds are stable. So talking about diamond stability field, um, uh, the little diagram you see on the left here, let me just get my uh, pointer going. This diagram over here has a stability field in terms of pressure increasing downwards and temperature increasing to the right. Uh, of the graphite diamond curve. It's a curve that I've spent a lot of time studying in different, in different versions. And there are different geotherms indicated here. And these geotherms that are correspond to the cratonic lithosphere intersect the graphite diamond stability field in this wedge over here. When you map that onto the craton, then the first, the, the shallowest intersection is at that point over there, which is this point over here. Uh, when you hit something called the adirat, which is that point over there, it's either over there or on the right hand side over there. That's where you, that's where you see a graphite diamond at higher temperature and higher pressure. So you see there's a curvature to the graphite diamond stability field over here. And then at the bottom of the, of the system, right over there, you, you, that's where your geotherm intersects this thing called the adirat. That's over there. And that maps out this region of the cratonic root, which is inside the diamond stability field. The differences between what's called the lithosphere over here and the asthenosphere down here is that the lithosphere is conductive, it's stable, um, it's not convecting. The asthenosphere, on the other hand, is moving, it's convecting, and so it carries heat in a very different way than what the lithosphere does. And this distinction between conductive heat transfer and convecting heat transfer is absolutely fundamental uh, if you're in the diamond industry and we will spend a lot of time studying the effects thereof. As I've said, diamonds are stable at about 900 to 1200 degrees centigrade in normal cratonic keels as displayed in this image. 98% of mined diamonds in the world have a lithospheric source. In other words, they come out of this portion of the cratonic root. If you get kimberlites that take off from inside the graphite st uh, stability field on the edges of the craton or the craton margin, if you want, these things have taken off outside of the diamond stability field and they don't contain diamonds. So as you go from a craton, towards its margin, you often find a transition into kimberlites that do not contain diamonds. And obviously those are the ones we want to uh, eliminate from consideration uh, when we do diamond exploration. And we can simply eliminate them by going across the craton margin and recognizing that craton margins have particular features that tell you that you may not be in the diamond stability field. Kimberlites that take off from inside the cratonic root and inside the diamond stability field uh, at various depths. Um, they will entrain package, packets of mantle material, transport that to surface. Uh, and those are the ones that ultimately, a small proportion of those will ultimately become the diamond mining industry. Uh, in this case, we've seen one in illustrated that has taken a packet of diamonds and it's died before it's reached surface. So it's a failed kimberlite. In this case, one uh, is taken off from here to there. Um, and it also collects material in the lower crust. And so when it erupts its surface, it has a mixture of mantle-derived material, 
which is quite deep, and then some shallower stuff as well. And both of those are then mixed and erupted at surface. And so these different journeys that these magmas take from inside the diamond stability field and what they carry to surface are part of what we find at the surface um, and has a, makes a distinct impression on the mineralogy of the material that we then see at surface over here. So there's a lot of different concepts on this particular diagram, but it all contributes to the material that we see at surface. The kind of rocks that we find uh, for, that are being carried up from uh, the, the diamond route, here's a picture of Perilitite Xenolus. It turns out these are from Kimberley. Uh, they're very heavy. Uh, there's a safety factor. If you don't have your hard, your hard toed boots um, on and you drop one of these on your toes, you will know about it. Your, your toes will be crushed. They're very heavy, very dense, and they're made up of dense minerals. And that turns out to be useful for mineral separation. The xenolith is a foreign rock. Xenos is foreign. Lith is rock. So these, these rocks are foreign rocks at surface. That's why we call them xenoliths. They're composed, in the case of pyrrhotites, mostly of olivine. Then you also have uh, orthopyroxene, clinopyroxene, garnet. In this case, it's a chrome-bearing garnet. It's purple in color. Sometimes you get chromite as well. The two rock types that we will talk a lot about are hardspergites and lerzolites. Hardspergite has olivine, orthopyroxene, no clinopyroxene, and something called the G10 garnet, which I'll explain in some detail a little bit later. A lerzolite is the same as a hardspergite, except it contains clinopyroxene over there and a different category of garnet or different chemistry of garnet that we call a G9 garnet. The other rock type that we pay a lot of attention to are eclogites. Here's a very coarse grained eclogite xenolith over here. It's about 15 centimeters long. It comes from Roberts Victor um, in the central part of Craton. It's a very famous kimberlite. It has a lot of eclogites in it, uh, eclogite xenoliths in it. Um, here's a diamond bearing eclogite xenolith, and here's an eclogitic garnet included inside a diamond. Eclogites are very simple rocks. They have mostly garnet. These are low chrome garnets, they're orange in color, um, and they can have about 35, maybe a little bit more of clinopyroxene. It's a sodic clinopyroxene, which we call omphacite, and then a range of different uh, accessory minerals rutile, kyanite, corundum, coesite. Um, and I can't remember many more. There's a variety of, if you want, eclogitic rocks, um, which are called peroxonites. They're, they're basically garnet pyroxene rocks in which um, either clinopyroxene or orthopyroxene um, are unusually modally abundant. Um, uh, in this case, you can see it's the same mineralogy as an eclogite. It's green clinopyroxene plus, uh, plus uh, light colored garnet, but there's a lot of clinopyroxene. Um, in this case, we would call it then peroxonite. If you add olivine into the mix, then the rock is called a Websterite. I'm just gonna keep those as a variety um, and our focus will be on pyrrhotites and eclogites. Here's what these English look like in section. On the left is a coarse grain garnet lozolite. Notice the scale over here. These grains, individual grains, are you know one to two millimeters uh, in terms of garnets. They can be much bigger for olivines. Here are some pyroxenes that are also quite uh, coarse grained. Uh, when you put stress, in particular stress at temperature, on a rock like this, you recrystallize it. These are all recrystallized olivines. You can see there's a recrystallized or partly recrystallized uh, pyroxene over there you get what is called a sheared garnet lerzolite texture. Notice that the garnets are not sheared out. It's very rare for garnet to get sheared out because it's a cubic mineral. Again, the scale, these garnets are approaching one and a half millimeter in size. You have two eclogites on the right-hand side, just again to emphasize the, the, the coarse grain size. Uh, there's a centimeter. Uh, that's a three millimeter garnet. This one's even bigger. Um, and in this case, 
uh, you can see there's a root tile, there's a common accessory in Aphrodite. So if you, um, if you disaggregate these, these xenoliths, um, these mineral constituents, in particular the coarse grain mineral constituents, then become single crystals, and that's what we recover from kimberlites. Um, and they're basically the same minerals that I've been discussing. Um, but in addition, we also find diamond as a disaggregated mineral from these rock types. And so therefore we, we, we study these, uh, uh, these minerals because they occur in association with diamond. So here are some pretty pictures of exactly that process. Kimberlites are mantle melts. They contain variable proportions of both mantle and crustal debris um, as single crystals. Uh, let's look at this one at the left here. Obviously, there's a nice octahedral diamond. But look over there. There's a purple garnet over there. And you can see these splotches of light green everywhere throughout this, this, this specimen of kimberlite, those are olivines um, and they're quite large. And so one of the most, uh, you know, most useful indicators potentially of mantle material is olivine inside a kimberlite. On the right hand side, a uh, different picture, a nice, uh, a, a nice uh, a, a step growth a diamond over there. There's a mineral over there, that's ilmenite. We'll talk about ilmenite right at the end of this lecture. This is a crustal xenolith sitting over there. These splotches that you see over here, these are all olivines. And there's a garnet sitting over there. And there's another garnet with just faint red color sitting on the right hand side over there. But you can see that even in a very small sample of kimberlite, it's, it's packed with indicator minerals. And when we process these rocks, we can recover those indicator minerals and then uh, analyze them. And that's the science of indicator mineral chemistry. And so the short word for, for indicator mineral chemistry is KIMS, and that's an abbreviation for Kimberlite indicator minerals. Now you know where they come from. They are all xenocrysts in Kimberlite. So when you recover them from a kimberlite, you do so by uh, heavy mineral uh, separation methods, TBE, um, methylene iodide. Um, there are all sorts of different heavy, heavy liquid media that you can use to recover these, these heavy minerals. Um, and in this case, we see images here from, from a concentrate from Diavik A154 North. Um, we can see peritotic olivine these uh, brown ones over here. Chrome the upside, the green ones over there. Um, garnet, of, of course, it's the red and purple stuff. There's some diamonds, they have high relief. There's a diamond there, another diamond there, another diamond there. There's another little, little octahedron over there and uh, another one over there. Uh, also in this picture, there's some ecliveric garnets. Um, they're the orange colored ones over there. And we'll talk about the difference uh, or the significance of this color difference, orange versus purple, uh, as we go through the rest of this talk. What's not shown on this, uh, in these images are chromite, orthopyroxene and ilmenite. Uh, we also don't have a picture of omphacite in here, but we'll, uh, we'll see other pictures of those. So, how do you use the kimberlite indicator minerals? We've now spoken about um, uh, the quantity of in, uh, kimberlite indicator minerals that you might find per kilogram of, of kimberlite. I've shown you some pictures of that. Um, this is one of the things that John Gurney and Mineral Services developed. Uh, they developed a kimberlite, kimberlite indicator mineral scoring system, AKA Mantle Mapper. Um, and they measure two things, uh, the abundance of kimberlite indicator minerals per kilogram of kimberlites, in other words, the quantity. And then also they analyze the representative chem chemistry to determine the quality uh, of those indicator minerals 
in comparison to diamond inclusions. And that's a science all of its own, and I'll cover that during the rest of the talk. The score then is a multiplication of the amount of indicators um, by their diamond associated quality. Um, and here's a set of data. Uh, here's an Eclogite score, here's a prototype score, um, and um, segmented in color. Uh, by kimberlites from the Ecarti property. This diagram comes out of this NI43101, which is in the public domain, um, into four different uh, categories. The ones that turned out to be mines in red, the ones that were resources but not yet mined in green, the ones that had you know exploration potential, we need, needed further work um, in a sort of a dark purple color over here, and then the rest. And so the mantle mapper system as implemented at ICARDI uh, had these outcomes um, in terms of both an ectoguide component that was important, considered important, and a prototype component that was considered important. Um, and most importantly, it was backed up by spatially correlated microdiamond samples. So very many, many people forget about this, this part of the story. Um, it's something that John Gurney was very um, uh, insistent on, that you cannot use this type of Kim scoring system in isolation of checking against diamonds. Anybody who does that, you know, who, who only looks at Kimberlite indicator mineral chemistry or abundance, and does not consider the actual diamond result is simply speculating because there's no uh, accountability in that process. If you do consider the micro diamond or the macro diamond information in, in, in concert with this information, then you're actually doing some real science and you are being accountable to yourself in what you are putting out as your ectoguide or prototype score. So as an example of how Kim scoring might work, here's a picture of prototype mantle xenolus in an alkali basalt. Uh, that's from, uh, from China. Uh, we can all see that this, uh, this outcrop over here, if you sampled it, it would have an extremely high um, quantity of prototype material per kilogram of basalt. It turns out all of these are spinel prototypes in this. They are not from the diamond stability field. Uh, in other words, the quality of these prototypes in this would be zero in terms of diamonds. And so your score would be high in terms of quantity, but zero in terms of quality. And the net of that would put you at the origin of this diagram right there. Uh, this is useless in terms of diamond um, uh, diamond forecasting, um, and you don't even need this, th this over here because you know that these zinless don't come from the diamond stability field. All right, so let's look at um, P-type diamond inclusions. This is the basis of, of how to do the quality assessment. We're obviously gonna look at um, olivine orthopyroxene garnet chromite chrome the oxide. That's not everything that I'm going to cover, but I will show some of these data. Just notice that we're looking now at purple garnets included in diamonds. That's the basis of how John Gurney uh, and also the Russians uh, looked at this, uh, at this problem, the association, and we'll start with olivine. This is a comprehensively updated olivine uh, diagram. It's the first time I've shown it. You saw, uh, we've got data here for olivine from, from prototype zinless, 5,346 data points. Uh, olivine in diamond as an inclusion, 1,500 data points. We can say with substantial confidence that diamond inclusions have high nickel relative to you know, the rest of the world and also a high magnesium number or in olivine terms, a phosphorite content. You can see this red cloud of data over here. And so you can discriminate 
um, olivines that occur inside diamonds, or prolytic olivines inside diamonds, from olivines that generally occur in the mantle with, um, you know, there's a specific field for diamond inclusions over here. If you want to use that knowledge uh, as uh, to be useful as a kimberlytic indicator, you have to consider the preservation of olivine, which is often a problem, particularly in, uh, in, in Southern Africa and also in the tropics. Olivine very often weathers, and so it doesn't survive at surface. And so its usefulness as a kimberlytic indicator is limited by the fact that it's often not preserved. However, when it is preserved in either cold climates like in Canada or in dry climates like in deserts, um, it does occur as a very large, in other words, two millimeters, one millimeter size fraction um, and very common mantle xenocryst. And um, it has been used um, in, in Canada uh, to a significant degree for, for, for diamond exploration. When you do that and you do recover uh, olivine from surface samples, uh, you have to consider something else. There are other rock types that are also shedding olivines. We all know that basalts have olivine in them um, and you can find olivine from non-kimbolytic sources. Also, in other words, magmatic phenocrysts from non-kimbolytic sources also in your sample and you have to discriminate um, those. In general, you could use their chemistry because uh, phenocrystic olivine from a basalt, for instance, would not even plot on this diagram over here. It will generally be fall off down to the left hand side here, lower uh, phosphorite contents and lower nickel content. I'm not going to say more about olivine. I will quickly touch on orthopyroxene. That's the next mineral that we see uh, as a colorless inclusion inside diamond is, uh, is orthopyroxene. This is the chemistry of, of orthopyroxene from uh, garnet lozolite zinnolith uh, in Canada. Um, I'm not going to talk about that right now um, because we're going to talk in the next lecture how you can use this information to derive mantle geotherms. Um, and if you wanted to use orthopyroxene as a kimberlytic indicator mineral, you face this problem again, same problem as with olivine. Uh, orthopyroxene does not survive at surface. Uh, in fact, orthopyroxene has a reaction relationship with kimberlite melt. And so it is resorbed inside a kimberlite melt. And you very rarely actually find orthopyroxene as a xenocryst, a preserved xenocryst uh, in kimberlites. Uh, although I will show some examples in Canada um, where we have found that, but it's very rarely used as a kimberlite indicator mineral. The other uh, mineral that's pyrotitic that we often we, that we sometimes right. see as an inclusion uh, in diamond is clinopyroxene. Mm. Here's a nice picture of a whole bunch of clinopyroxene sitting inside a diamond. Um, uh, when you want to use clinopyroxene as a chem indicator, um, you have to realize that clinopyroxene, greenish colored clinopyroxene, does occur as a magmatic phenocryst in basaltic rocks, in gabroic rocks, um, particularly primitive uh, uh, basaltic rocks. Um, and so it's the same problem as with uh, olivine over here. There are a lot of non-kimbolytic clinopyroxenes that will turn up in your samples and you will have to discriminate against those because they don't tell you anything about the mantle. When you do find clinopyroxene, as a kimberlytic indicator mineral, in other words, a mantle derived indicator mineral, you can squeeze mantle geotherms out of that. I've done a lot of that kind of work and that will be covered in the next lecture. That brings us to chromite. So we take the same approach as we've, we've taken for, for olivine. I've comprehensively updated this diagram. It's the first time I've shown this diagram. Uh, chromite occurs as an inclusion inside diamond over here. Um, also, uh, this is a picture of a diamond bearing a Hartsbergite in which chromite coexists with a purple garnet over here. 
These are very special rock types. I've specialized in those. Um, these chromite compositions, because they're associated with diamond, and these chromite compositions, because they're included in diamond, all fall in uh, this part of the diagram. Uh, and compared to chromites that you find in general in uh, a mental xenolith, the diamond inclusions of high chrome and elevated magnesium in a very restricted field over here. We've got over a thousand data points over here. Um, chromite in xenolus, pyrrhotite xenolus, uh, 1,800 data points sitting over here. Um, and this differentiation um, in, in composition of diamond inclusion chromites from other chromites that occur in pyrrhotitic um, uh, xenolus uh, leads to a diamond inclusion field that is roughly at above 62 weight percent chrome. Um, and these are distinctive of the associated quality of, of chromites, uh, the chemical quality that you are interested in, in terms of um, um, the chem scoring system that uh, John Gurney developed. Um, again, if you want to use this information, um, uh, for kimberlitic indicator mineral studies, there are a couple of things that you need to consider. Um, the one is preservation. And chromites uh, have a different preservation profile than silicates. It's an oxide mineral. And so it turns out it's a resistant mineral and it survives where all your silicates may have been um, weathered. So if you go into Australia, where there's been a lot of sufficient weathering, um, you will destroy your olivine, your orthopyroxene, your garnet, your clinopyroxene. And the two minerals that are left are oxide minerals, either chromite or ilmenite. And so chromite comes into its own as an indicator mineral in these heavily weathered terrains. Um, and it is often the only indicator mineral that you can use in those heavily weathered uh, terrains and in Australia is a particular example, but I know of a number of other um, situations around the world where the, the resistate nature of chromite makes it um, the ideal or only mineral in which you can, um, you can, you can trace back to source um, and um, use this chemical information as a discrimination. When you do so, you have to be uh, vigilant about grain sizes. Chromites are actually su substantially smaller um, than the silicates that we usually use as kimberlite indicator minerals. Um, in particular, you typically have to go down to about 0.3 millimeter in size fraction, sometimes even smaller, uh, 0.18 millimeter. I've seen people recover chromites at. Um, because it's a smaller, it's a smaller mineral. Um, and so you have to modify your field sampling parameters to be able to utilize this chemical information because if you don't recover your chromite, you can't even analyze it. So you use smaller grain sizes. In addition, um, chromites also occur as magmatic phenocrysts in things like the salts. Um, and so you have the same problem that you have with other magmatic phenocrysts. You have to discriminate magmatic chromite phenocryst compositions from mantle xenocryst compositions uh, after you've analyzed the chromite. Um, and that's an inhibitor, and it's a specialized field in terms of indicator mineral uh, chemistry application. That process, though, the knowledge of, of, of doing this, looking at the chemistry of phenocrysts versus mantle xenocrysts, has led to the recognition that chromite occurs in this plot, which is a chrome titanium plot. Um, chromite occurs as a phenocryst in kimberlites. Um, we can see here's a little chromite over here. It has a core, which is actually a xenocryst over there. It has an overgrowth, and the stuff in the middle of this overgrowth is kimberlite melt. And this is a phenocryst composition. If you go from its, you know, its core to its rim, you see the phenocryst compositions evolve in this direction. 
And if you find that inside a kimberlite, you see the kimberlite ground mass chromites go off in that direction. So you see early phenocryst composition somewhere over here. And then you see ground mass compositions over there. And because of that knowledge, you can use um, the phenocryst compositions and the ground mass compositions of chromite in kimberlite, and they're actually quite distinctive compositions, to monitor the evolution of the kimberlite magma in terms of fractionation. In other words, the down temperature uh, processes that happen in kimberlites. And very importantly, also of oxidation, because oxidation, as we know, um, it resorbs diamonds, it affects the diamonds. And so you can find out um, how that may have, how your kimberlite melt has interacted with the Xenocris diamond population and may have resorbed the diamonds by studying the chromite phenocryst compositions in kimberlites. And so that brings us on to the elephant in the room, which is garnet. We use garnet a lot in terms of kimberlite indicator mineral uh, compositions. And one of the reasons we do so is because um, there's a lot of included, uh, garnets are often included uh, inside diamonds and people have studied them. Uh, one of the people who have studied them is John Gurney, 1984, who published a seminal paper in a very obscure little journal in, um, um, uh, in Western Australia. Um, and this is the diagram that he put up at the time. And he, the diagram was of peritidic type inclusions in diamonds as a chrome calcium diagram. Um, and John, if you read this paper carefully, John drew a line, which is this line over here, now known as the G10, G9 line, such that it was situated with 85% of, of, of garnet compositions to the left, low calcium compositions to the left, and 15% of the compositions to the right. That was intentionally drawn that way. Uh, it was something that John made up. He said, it's a, let's do an 85-15 split of the data available, but he didn't do the split um, um, without other input of other information. He used actually xenolith information that we'll see in a moment. But just remember 8515 for chrome larger than two, there's an 85% association of, of garnet of these compositions relative to those compositions with diamond. This is the comprehensively updated version of the diagram that, um, that uh, John Gurney published in 1984. Um, this is as of 2021. We've got uh, over 1,100 um, uh, uh, diamond inclusion compositions above two weight percent chrome. That's this part of the world um, of that diagram since then. Um, and it, it turns out the numbers are now 82% G10 and 18% uh, G9 relative to that line. So 82% of the data fall in this part of the diagram. 18% of this for in that part of the diagram. Um, and that's what that diagram now looks like at the bottom over here. These are all low chrome uh, garnet compositions. They are also called eclogitic or E-type garnet uh, uh, inclusions in diamonds. We'll talk about those in a moment. But on the right-hand diagram over here, I also show um, garnet compositions in mantle xenoliths. So this is the diamond inclusion picture. This is the picture for mantle xenoliths. That's from my own database. Um, there are 3,900 analyses above 28% chrome on these diagrams. It's the first time I've shown this diagram in this format. If you look at the numbers, um, this part of the diagram has 16% of the data. This part of the diagram has 84% of the data. And so that's almost an exact flip of these numbers, 82 versus 18, uh, 16 versus 84. And that leads us to uh, 
a little calculation, which is the same calculation that Gurney did in 1984. Essentially, Gurney in 1984, if we updated it, it says on average, there is a 24 fold preferential association, or if you want partition of carbon in pyridotite for G10 Hartsbergite over G9 Lothite. Where does the 24 come from? It's 82 over 18, which is that number over that number, multiplied by 84 over 16, which is that number over that number, that gives you 24. In other words, if you find a, a Garnet composition in this part of the diagram, relative to one in this part of the diagram, there is a 24 fold uh, statistical increase in the probability of that diamond, uh, that Garnet composition being associated with diamond. That's what, that's what John Gurney put into the public domain in 1984. Those numbers haven't changed much uh, in time, nor with much bigger data sets uh, that are available to us today. Okay, so this diagram that's, uh, that's, the, that's called the, the, the garnet chrome calcium diagram has a different life as well. It has now become, um, uh, it's been repurposed uh, to identify different assemblages in pyridotites. So a G10 garnet composition, as we have over here, is associated with a Hartsbergite mineralogy, olivine plus OPX plus G10 garnets. There's no CPX. It's also called a low calcium garnet. So when you find one of these garnet compositions over here, you know the assemblage that that garnet came from. Um, same for a G9 garnet composition. If you find one of these in over here, we know that it comes from a rock that has olivine, orthopyroxene, and clinopyroxene, and it's identified by having this G9 garnet composition, also known as a calcium saturated garnet because that garnet coexists with clinopyroxene and derived from a lizardic rock type. We don't often see G12s. They are verlitic garnet compositions. Uh, they come from orthopyroxene free rocks. And so the assemblage there is quite an unusual one, olivine, clinopyroxene plus G10 garnet. Um, and as we can see, this field is empty. There isn't a real a diamond association associated with verlitic um, uh, compositions. The person who first pointed this out is Nick Sobolev, and he'll make a cameo appearance in a moment in 1973. But I have to point out something else um, on these diagrams. Many of you will notice, would have noticed there's the sloping line over here. The sloping line uh, has its origin from considering which pyridotite xenoliths contain diamond in them or contain graphite in them. That's work that I did. I put it into public into the public domain with permission from the Beers. I initially did, did the work with the Beers, and then uh, the, I was subsequently allowed to publish that. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But essentially, on this diagram over here, you can see that graphite is stable in pyritidic garnet garnet bearing pyritides, both lozolites and hartsbergites, up to this line but not beyond. Um, diamond is stable on both sides of the line in terms of garnet composition, but it's uniquely stable without the presence of graphite above that line. And so this line has become known as the graphite diamond constraint. It's fundamental in terms of how we view the, the garnet chrome calcium plot these days. Um, and to separate the diamond association that's below this line from the graphite association that is also below this line, you need to use a temperature um, uh, indicator. You can use nickel temperatures, nickel in garnet, or manganese temperatures, manganese in garnet. And we'll talk about that a little later. Uh, that's what this barometer looks like in terms of um, a chrome calcium diagram. 
uh, it gives you a minimum pressure um, just from the, the garnet composition. If you assume a geotherm, you can all read about that. This is online free uh, in this paper, 2006 Journal of Petrology. Again, uh, thank you for the beers for allowing me to publish uh, uh, this important distinction uh, or repurposing of the chrome calcium diagram uh, in terms of phase equilibrium. So the key learnings from this part of the talk is uh, carbon likes G10 bearing Hartzbergite 24 times more than G9 lazulite. The chrome pyrope chrome calcium plot is a phase diagram. It is not just a geochemical diagram. And this would not be the case. The separation of graphite bearing material from diamond bearing material at such a sharp line over here would not be the case if you did not assume major element equilibrium in peridotite. This is a very important aspect of what's going on in the background of this phase diagram is it's not a disequilibrium phase diagram. It's an equilibrium phase diagram. There are lots of things happening on the chrome calcium diagram that we can do as a result of the fact that we can assume major element equilibrium in peridotites as we analyze from single grains of garnet. Um, I want to pay tribute to a guy that we lost uh, earlier this year, Nick Sobolev. This is a, a partial figure two from his 73 paper. Just look at what he published in 1973. The G9, G10, G12 fields that we have labeled up here existed in 1973. The sloping line that you see over here is parallel to these lines over here. These came out of experiments that the Russians did in the early 70s. And I used those experimental results as partial uh, resolution in this, in this diagram that I did over here. These circular um, uh, symbols over here, these are all diamond inclusion compositions, which correspond basically to these uh, compositions over here. This line over here, labeled 1-1, one, one, is the line in which Nick Sobolev found lozolytic assemblages, in other words, ones that belong in the G9 field, all the way to the left into the subcalcic field as a result of the sodium content of the climate pyroxene. We've lost that information. People don't pay attention to that anymore. The line you see up here is the chrome, the highest chrome content of garnet, uh, um, garnet compositions that they had recorded by 1973 in Russia. Uh, and it goes a little bit up there. Um, it's off the diagram on this side, but that line still stands today. So this is the stuff that the Russians were had available to them um, before 1973. In fact, this story goes back to at least 1967. Um, and it's all a result of this guy. And Nick Sobolev is a giant in the field. And we should never forget the contribution that the Russians have made to diamond science. With that, we'll move on to uh, eclogitic E-type diamonds. As I said before, uh, eclogites are garnet CPX rocks. They're light colored garnets, orange, here they are. Uh, here's the uh, clinoparoxene over here. I've taken this picture in particular because you can see this is omphacitic uh, clinoparoxene and it's breaking down. Omphacite doesn't survive to surface. It very regularly breaks down into this milky kind of intergrowth, uh, a fine grained uh, breakdown. And so it disaggregates and becomes too small size and gets altered very quickly. And we very, very rarely recover omphacitic diamond, uh, omphacitic uh, pyroxene. So we can't use it as, a, um, as an indicator mineral. But we do use uh, eclogitic garnet as the primary indicator mineral for, uh, um, uh, for eclogites um, for the reason that it occurs as an inclusion in diamonds. Here's some other diamond inclusion. These are actually garnets over there. Occasionally, we see other 
uh, a rare accessory minerals. Uh, this is a blue uh, kyanite, and here's some sulfides. But largely we will talk, be talking about garnet. They are orange, they are low chrome. I've shown you them on the previous diagram. Because they're low chrome, we don't plot chrome. Um, we can assume chrome is very near to zero in all these garnets. But we do plot their calcium, magnesium, um, iron, and sometimes manganese compositions. And when you do that for, um, for garnet compositions in carbon-free eclogites, there's about 800 data points over here, you see a very big range of calcium, magnesium, iron compositions. Um, and if you compare that with garnet compositions in carbon bearing eclogites, uh, about a third of the data, um, you see basically the same range of compositions. You see this is the highest density of data is sitting over here. It's the same distribution of data over there. Irrespective of whether that eclogite xenolith has graphite in it in open symbols or diamond in it in solid symbols. And so unlike the case um, for G10 versus G9 garnets, there is no obvious geochemical affinity of carbon for particular eclogitic garnet, magnesium, iron, calcium compositions. In other words, there's an equal carbon association or partition across all eclogitic uh, uh, magnesium, iron, calcium, garnet compositions, as you can see in these diagrams over there. So there's no easy way to just use the major element composition of a garnet that comes from an eclogite to differentiate uh, whether it should be associated with diamond or graphite. But in 1984, um, John Gurney put out this diagram over here. In fact, this is the 1993 version um, in which he repurposed a a, a sodium larger than 0.07 weight percent uh, threshold that was initially uh, uh, um, put out by Nick Sobolev um, as an indicator of the lowest sodium content of diamond association um, based on the inclusion compositions of, of garnets in eclogitic diamonds. Five minutes. Yeah, I'll be going over. Uh, I, I requested an hour for this uh, uh, talk. Okay, carry on. And, uh, okay. Um, this is the updated version of that same diagram. We now have a lot more data. Um, um, uh, it's 1,300 um, other. In this diagram over here, um, it, uh, Argyle occupied these, um, these solid squares. Um, I've separated Argyle out in, in the updated version as well, just so that we can compare things. It's quite important that we do, because most of the data is not like what you see at Argyle. Argyle remains extreme. In other words, uh, most other localities have sodium less than 0.4, roughly over there. And you can see that the bulk of the data is sitting over there, as is the bulk of the data less than 0.4 over here. Um, and mostly that's where we, in, in, in actual applications, we mostly cut this diagram off at 0.4 weight percent sodium. If you look at my Xenolith database, 85% of diamond eclogite Xenoliths have sodium larger than 0.07 to, to a maximum of about 0.3 weight percent. That's 418 or 419 data. And 76% of graphite eclogite xenoliths have high sodium, but up to a maximum of 0.18. That's uh, less data, 39 or 51. Um, and so the updated version of the sodium threshold that uh, Gurney put out in 1984 is basically this. Sodium titanium metasomatism accompanies diamond and graphite deposition in eclogite. In other words, eclogitic diamonds, at least we are now know, are met metasomatic in eclogite. And therefore you can find elevated sodium titanium 
in any ecligaric garnet that is associated with carbon, whether that carbon is either diamond or graphite. What that means in terms of uh, uh, diamond exploration or, uh, or application is it's quite difficult to tell a graphite bearing eclogite diamond from a diamond bearing eclogite. Um, and we have not yet found a solution to that problem. Um, instead, we're just saying that sodic eclogitic garnets have an association with carbon and sometimes that carbon is diamond and sometimes it's graphite. So what's the value of you know, garnet compositions? What's a, you know, the relative value of peridotitic diamonds uh, versus eclogitic diamonds? Um, so here are some numbers. Diamond eclogite singulars have in situ grades of 1,000 to 20,000 carats per ton. Diamond peridotite singulars have in situ grades of 5 to 550 carats per ton. There's one exception, that's from Premier. It has a very high grade. Um, and if we convert that into numbers um, for use as kimberlitic indicator minerals, then we can go through this scoring system over here, a G9 garnet. If you assign a score of one to that, then the G10D score is 24. We've see, go, gone through that calculation before. And a G3D score, in other words, an a diamond associated eclogitic garnet score is a thousand over five, which is that number divided by that number, times 24, which is that number over there, times five over 50. Um, and the five over 50 comes from the fact that peridotites have roughly five modal percent garnet, whereas eclogites have roughly 50% modal, modal percent garnet. And so you get more garnet per unit uh, volume, uh, 10 times more garnet per unit volume from an eclogite than you do from a peridotite. And so you end up with a score of about 480. You can do the same calculation, um, 20,000 over 550, that's that number over that number, times 24 times five over 50 is 87. So you can put into this question mark box over here, either 87 or 480, it doesn't really matter. Um, the point is eclogitic diamonds or eclogitic garnets uh, are much more valuable in terms of the association of diamonds than G10 garnets are. Um, and that's something that we, uh, that we focus on uh, when we do kimberlitic indicator mineral analyses. So here's another cameo from a giant who left us two year, uh, three years ago, John Gurney. And I thought for this talk, I'll just put up the text that comes out of this paper, Gurney, Helmstedt and Moore, 1993, where he laid out the basics of this mantle mapper scoring system. And these are the same basic mineralogical tenets that today still underpin pre-mining assessment of primary diamond deposits. Um, kimberlites are basically a transporting agent for macro diamonds from the upper mantle to the earth's surface. The amount of diamond the kimberlite will contain will depend on at least six variables. How much diamond pyrotite did it sample? What was the grade of that pyrotite? How much diamond eclogite did it sample? What was the grade of the diamond eclogite? How well were the diamonds preserved during the transportation? How efficiently did they make their way to surface? This is the eclogite score versus the pyrotite score. The amount of diamond pyrotite or diamond eclogite that has been sampled should be reflected in the amount of disaggregated material, mineral grains, in other words, the quantity, if these can be identified, it should be possible um, to forecast whether the diamond could be present or not. Um, here's an interesting sentence. Forecasting accurately the diamond content of a rock that is in the mantle and cannot be directly sampled is unfortunately impossible 
so that variations in B and D cannot be quantified in any rigorous way. Classical sentence from John. Fortunately, the diamond indicator minerals can be identified by certain compositional parameters. And the higher the abundance of these minerals that are present in kimberlites, the better the diamond content of the body usually is. However, there are exceptions as must be ex expected from the considerations that are listed over here. Um, thank you, John, for giving us this realization of how to put this story together and then actually going and applying it in the real world, in particular at Icardi, but also earlier on uh, in Botswana with Falcon Bridge. That brings us to the last mineral that we need to consider. Uh, there are only two slides here, ilmenite. Uh, ilmenite is uh, strongly associated with particular kimberlite uh, 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 intrusions. Um, we separate mantle compositions and we call them kimberlite, kimberlitic from crustal or basaltic compositions, which are non-kimbolytic based on uh, a curve in titanium magnesium space. These are, are kimbolytic ilmenites. These ones are non-kimbolytic ilmenites. They come out of basaltic sources. Ilmenites unfortunately don't have a direct association with diamonds. They occur in uh, iron titanium metasomatic open systems in the mantle. Um, and because these are open systems, you can use their uh, chrome, aluminium, magnesium, plus or minus manganese contents as fingerprintings, uh, fingerprinting, and I'll show that in the next slide. I have to say something about presence and abundance. There are certain kimberlite intrusions that have no ilmenite in them whatsoever. Um, and so sometimes they are present and sometimes they are not present. Um, and when they are present, they are often very abundant. Um, and the abundance is related to the amount of metasomatic uh, interactions that have happened uh, in the course of the evolution of the kimberlite magma itself or pre kimberlite magma. Um, and so the study of ilmenites and what they mean to us as indicator minerals is an ongoing topic. These are two very important references, uh, Bruce Wyatt's work, which is where these two diagrams come from, but also um, a, a reference, a uh, work done by uh, Dan Schulze, um, uh, published in International Geology Review. One of the applications that you could put ilmenites to is tracing them back to source. Um, in other words, uh, ilmenite provenance. There's uh, three examples here that come from Canada. There's a map of Canada, lots of kimberlite fields in black across the Canadian uh, shield. Uh, lots of cratons in Canada to worry about. Um, I've shown just three plots of ilmenite. It's a chrome magnesium diagram in each case. These diagrams are all scaled exactly the same size. And the ones in the bottom right here, these are ilmenites that have traveled 350 kilometers down ice away from the Victor Kimberlite. Notice there are no low chrome ilmenites here. These ilmenites all have a very particular sort of wedge shape or triangular shape uh, set of compositions. And you can compare those against these. These ilmenites come from the Fort Alaporn Kimberlites. They also traveled more than 350 kilometers away from a particular source. And their compositions are completely different from those ones over there. And so you can identify the source of where they've come from by their ilmenite composition. Up here in Nunavut in the NWT, there's an example uh, by Tilmora Diamonds. They've been hunting down uh, uh, kimberlitic ilmenites for a long time now. They still haven't found the source. Um, uh, or they haven't had the money to go and drill the source. They think they know where the source is, um, but they know they've got a unique source because of these ilmenite compositions over here that they repeat year after year when they sample there. Um, and you can see that these ilmenite compositions are again very different to those ones and those ones over there. So that's all I have to say about uh, uh, mental indicators 101. Uh, it's a big topic to cover in one lecture. And so uh, it took me an hour exactly. Um, I'm open for discussion and questions.
Well done, Herman. Thanks, Herman. That was excellent. Just to get it going, I mean, you you'll be familiar too with the, the the many of the when you go back to Russia and you commented on the olive beans there, you know they found lots of lots of nodules which were effect, effectively dunites in their you know in their mantle assemblage, so to speak. Uh, yeah, uh, John, I'll actually cover the the dunite story um, tomorrow. Okay. It's part Perfect. of the, it's part of the story uh, tomorrow. Yeah. Um, okay. It is. A, it's an important part of the story. Yeah. Yeah. Good. But just yeah. briefly, uh, just briefly, these things you see over here, these garnet compositions, these very low calcium garnet compositions, they are characteristic of dunites. Yeah. yeah very re very refractory. And 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 well done on in acknowledging and commenting on on Nick Sobolev. I mean, and, and John. I mean, they were both um, very big characters, um, you know. And and Nick was a wonderful person. I mean, you had you know far more direct interaction with him than I did. But uh, you know, we were we were very privileged to to have that sort of interaction. And and many of the other scientists that we interacted with from Russia or in Russia. You know, yeah, and, I was. Like, I, I got a bit yeah, emotional like there with. Yeah, I got a bit emotional yeah. there with Nick because you know, having having such a brilliant mind, put stuff together in in the way that he did and so prolifically. Um, it's you know, it's it's just an incredible resource that that I was privileged to to you know, to be able to uh, participate in. Yeah. Now, John too was a fascinating. John yes. was a fascinating character, much more competitive. I mean, he was a you know he was a super sportsman too. He he, he nearly played for Liverpool soccer team, I think. There's a question in the chat box there. Do you want to kick off with it, Herman? Is there a point to discriminate between mantle minerals that are xenocrystic in the kimberlite from those contained in zinnias? So that's uh, from Jay Rain. Um, is there a mm -hmm. point to discriminate between mantle minerals that are xenocrystic in the kimberlite from those contained in zinnias? But uh, Jane, yeah, there's a, that, that's a little point that I covered early on in this lecture. It's a very complicated lecture to give. Um, uh, the xenocrysts are actually derived from the mantle from the mantle zinnias. So it's um, um, it's. It's one and the same thing, so you do not discriminate them. They are the same association. So the xenocrysts that you find in the kimberlite are disaggregated from mantle xenolith. And so we consider them as part of the same data set. Yeah, and, and just to reiterate again, Herman, I mean, it goes back to the fact that, you know, that's where the diamonds sit and the, and the kimberlites are effectively the passenger trains that, you know, pick them up. Mm -hmm assuming their diamonds to be picked up. And so essentially just to just to give that an, a, a sort of a more expanded view on, on that question from Jay Rain, that's why this picture is on the right hand side over here. Um, uh, this is picture is from concentrate from Diavik, um, where there is an association between diamonds and different mantle minerals, both ecligaric and peritaric. And you can see that same association in xenoliths from Diavik, except you don't have access to as many xenoliths as you have xenocrysts. So from a statistical point of view, it's much easier to work with this material than work with xenoliths. And I'll make that point again in the next, uh, in the next lecture. Yeah, I just there, there are two more questions. I'll quickly cover yeah. those off. Uh, um, uh, okay. Here. In terms of calculating real pressure, how would you know if the garnet was in equilibrium coexisting with chromite? I will cover that in a lecture tomorrow. But essentially, if you see sloping lines on a chrome calcium diagram, then, uh, then that's a dead giveaway that, uh, that garnet coexisted with chromite. So I will cover that. And then Freddie Rulofsa has asked, in kimberlites, diamonds represent xenocrysts. What do they represent in the mantle source rocks? Question mark. Are they porphyroblasts? Um, 
Freddie, yes, you can think of them as porphyroblasts, but they haven't grown in the same way as porphyroblasts do. Um, they have grown as metasomatic minerals. Diamonds have grown as metasomatic minerals uh, inside a substrate, and that substrate is either peridotitic or ecliglitic. Um, so they're not crystalline products, they're metasomatic products. I hope that answers your question. Yeah. And Herman, it might just be useful to point out, particularly for our students, that um, one of the reasons that we were able to do so much good work and, and people like John Gurney and them were as well on, on mantle nodules and mantle assemblages is because of the fact that we had these amazing nodule dumps in and around Kimberley and, and the other old mines. And I mean, just, you know, just for interest, it goes back to the fact that when the mines were started in the 1869s, 1870s, in particularly in Kimberley, you know, there were, there were no big jaw crushes or crushing. So those, um, you know, the, 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 the samples that came out of the mantle ended up as these, as amazing nodules, um, you know, remnants of, of deep mantle material. And, and I guess, you know, that's played a very key um, um, aspect in us and in, in allowing us to understand the mantle so well. And, and those lovely specimens you show of um, diamondiferous eclogites and peridotites and, you know, the eclogites that came out of Roberts Victor. I mean, you know, you don't see that in modern, modern diamond mines or Canadian diamond mines very rarely, because, you know, because of the crushing and the communition. Yes. Um, and yeah, I mean, people like Joe Boyd and so on, they've, they've had a field day collecting xenoliths. Yeah. And, and these days we collect xenocrysts. And that's a fundamental difference in the way we look at the mantle these days. We look at it through the, the lens of single minerals, whereas previous generations looked at it through the lens of the whole rock, uh, the xenolith. And so understanding the relationship between the Xenolith studies and the Xenocryst studies that we do today is fundamental. And that's why that chrome calcium diagram and its assemblages that it represents, um, it, it's, it's quite fundamental in understanding. It's the link between the rock and the minerals that we study these days.